Uh, Truth, just put your camera on so I can just quickly interact with you, um, and then uh, we will get Wasn't you on. Truth, just oh, on. Truth, you've already been on. Truth, we're not going to get you on again. Uh, um, sorry, Truth, but it's it's, it's uh, uh, once you're on, uh, that's it. Okay, um, Bismarck and uh, Joseph Raj, if if you could please put your cameras on. Uh, 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 Joseph, we'll get you on next. Just give me a quick wave, Joseph, if that's okay. That's lovely, Joseph. You can turn the camera off if you like, or you can leave it on. Joseph, welcome to the stream. Oh, good, good afternoon. Or I don't good know what time good afternoon, over. Joseph. So, Joseph, whereabouts are you, um, uh, you know, coming in from today? Well, the United States. Oh, lovely. Okay. And um, from your picture, I'm presuming that you are a, a Christian. Is that, is that right? An or, I'm an Orthodox Christian. Priest. Orthodox Christian. Okay, lovely. So what question do you have for us, uh, Joseph, today? Well, First off, I do want to ask, I've asked this question on other shows uh, about Islam, and I'm always on the wrong show. This is a show where we can ask Muslims about Islam, correct? That's correct, yes. Perfect. Awesome. Okay, so I have a couple of questions. So, with a but, with a but, which is, a it but. goes both ways. Oh, yeah, Meaning, sure. Yeah, yeah okay. Um, Just here, that, right. That's fair, actually. I like the fact that there are multiple people because I like getting multiple perspectives. So the first question I have is about uh, Surah, I believe it's 548, which talks about confirming what was revealed before it. I'm sure you've heard about this uh, before, about the, the uh, Taurat and the Injil. Um, so my question is, uh, does the Quran itself state that the Bible is corrupted? Yeah, it does say so in Quran Surah 2, Ayah 2. Uh, which one? It's the second chapter of the Quran. Um, and which, hold on, because uh, that's an interesting mm -hmm. uh, point. And which verse? Uh, I think it's the second verse. Mm -hmm. All right, so let me. I'm gonna. I'm, well, I'm, it's gonna take me a while to pull this up because I am still I, very. I just tell you. I just tell you what it says. It says okay, now this says. Uh, this... Uh, that is the book in which there is no doubt, referring okay. to the Quran. Yeah, referring to right. the Quran. Yes. What is that? Yeah, so, but what? How does it say anything about what I just asked? Which is easy. Uh, did, that the Bible yeah. was corrupted. Easy. So you draw two columns, right? And you ask the question. How, uh, a book with no doubt would be a book complete of revelation, right? Mm -hmm. So in those two columns, the Quran would undergo which column? The one with no doubt or the one with doubt? Uh, I would assume if you're using the hermeneutic of this text, it would be the one with no doubt. No doubt, okay. And so any other book, uh, which category would that fall into? The one with doubt or the one without doubt? That's not, That's not established. You can't, yeah, it is. it's not a binary, yeah. like for example, a it is. I, I, I like, remember, mean. you're asking me as the Muslim, right? So, when you right. ask us Muslims what we believe, there is no other book without uh, any uh, uh, a level of doubt other than the Quran completely from cover to cover, and this is because it is verbatim the speech of Allah. Any other book, we can doubt maybe the wording of a companion. We could doubt maybe the, the 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 written transmission of a particular narration. That would be under doubt. But the only book we have no doubt in is the Quran itself. And now this, I, 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 realize, I, I assume I, this is back. To, this is because of the whole perfect preservation thing of the Quran. Uh, more than that, more beyond that, I would even say. But it includes that. But I just wanted to answer your question in this way. I'll tell you why. A lot of Christians come to the stream to think that they can explain to us what Muslims must believe about the revelations Allah mentions in the Quran. And so rather than I taking you to five, six, seven, eight different ayat, giving you the Muslim perspective, and then you saying back to me, but I think my understanding of these verses of the Quran is better or that it makes more sense to you as the Christian, therefore what you as the Muslim believe is wrong, you can just boycott that completely and get straight to the point. The Quran in its very second chapter lays out a very clear dichotomy that there are books without doubt and there are books with doubt. And so the Quran is the only book without doubt. The Bible, as it would seem, falls under the category of a book with doubt. And Please. as you read, as you read in 548, the Quran then tells us what to do with any book 
That is not the Quran. We use the Quran as the thing to examine that book. Simple. So how do you think your question has not been answered then? Um, well, because it's... One, first off, this leads me to a whole bunch of other questions, such as, um, I guess, like what uh, tafsir al-Quran bi kitab is, um, because from what I understand, that's interpretation of the Quran through the scriptures. Um, that said, uh, this presupposes, and that's not, I don't, I think it's fair to say that that is not actually what the intent of the text in the Quran says, because first they're see, speaking to Muslims, see, yeah, but then see, they're also... Like but when they like, speak to Christians and Jews, they do, say refer to your own scriptures, don't they? Do, do you see here how you made that point I told you that you were going to make? That you, the Christian, believe you can better exegete the Quran than the Muslim who believes in that book, right? Wait a and second. I, 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 and I can show you... the thing about the right, scriptures. I, and I can show you the problem that you're going to run into for your own self, right? Okay. Because it, it, here's the point it's going to come to. Do you believe I, as a Muslim can interpret the Bible for you better than you as an Orthodox Christian? I would say no. No. So would you accept my authority over the Bible? No. So then why do you come here to tell me that I should accept your authority over the Quran? I want clearly, to, I'm, clearly I'm not. you're not on the same level of understanding. But, but you just said that. You said to me you disagree, and then you try to bring a verse that you but think contradicts right, what I'm saying. So it doesn't exactly exactly work that point. way. But, but this is that exactly you contradict. My point. Yourself? Um, no, that, it's not a contradiction okay. of myself. It's that we hold two different positions as to what is absolutely correct for our own re reasons, fundamentally, whether they come directly from the text or for other reasons. What I'm trying to understand um, is I'm trying to understand those parts of the Quran which lead to, for lack of a better term, error conclusions among the Christians and the Jews. Certainly not mm -hmm. all the Christians and the Jews who heard the message of the Quran converted and became Muslims. As a matter of fact, in some cases, there was mockery. Some of that is recorded, so on and so forth. St. John of Damascus, who someone, I guess a Muslim guy, did like a two-hour thing on a two-page document about, um, what clearly did not recognize uh, the Quran. But more importantly, here's... Yeah, here's why would John of Damascus accept the Quran? No, well, not only did he, so he thought it was, he, he, his words were stronger than that, than simply, yeah, I don't I'm, accept I mean, the Quran. Uh, yeah, yeah, but I mean, um, the same applies to the Bible. Right, of yeah. course. Well, uh, yeah, but that's, yeah. The, that's the other question I have, because yes. I often hear Islamic, um, do, the, I guess the Dua guys, I guess you call them, Dua folk. Well, this is a Dua channel. Uh, I guess that means outreach. Um, the whole point is uh, constantly talking about the difficulty in ascertaining the veracity of the text of the Bible. But nobody talks about the Ismanic Codex, which was literally created because there were so many corrupt versions of the Quran. How um, did that I, can, uh, I would just correct that. So there is no teaching that says because there were so many corrupt versions of the Quran that the Uthmanic Qurasim was developed. That's in no particular teaching. That would actually be incorrect. Uh, uh, by the way, so let me be clear here. Mm -hmm. Do you understand textual criticism of the Bible and of the Quran? I, uh, yes, I do. Now, okay, I can't okay. say so that I've delved into it in the Quran like I have in the Bible. No, I but let's delve into it. Fine. Let's delve into it for just a moment, right? Just yeah. for a moment, right? So, of the Quran, we have manuscripts of it from the 7th century CE. One potentially, or rather two, within possibly the lifetime of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. We're not saying with certainty, but with the possibility of being within his lifetime. If not within his lifetime, at least within the first Islamic century, on the earlier side of the of, of uh, the century, rather than the later half. So this is something that us Muslims can look at. We can appeal to his epigraphic evidence. What there are many the things of, that what, we what, can... What is the name right? of that particular manuscript? That, so I can give you a couple if you want, right? So there's the Sanaa manuscript. There is the um, Arabica Mingana one, uh, 1572A, I think. Uh, and then it's Codex uh, Parasino Petropolitanus, which has folios of the Arabic Mingana 1572A. There's Kof 47. There's Top Copy. There's Top Copy Sarai Medina 1A, well, I, I, I was et specifically cetera. talking about yeah. that one that can be traced possibly to the life of Muhammad. Yeah, two of them. One would be the Sana manuscript, and the second would be um, the Birmingham manuscript. Okay, so the. So, so but the remember, I'm, just keep in mind, I'm raising this to say to you, and to complete my thought, mm -hmm. that as a Christian, right, 
there are no firmly dated manuscripts within at least a hundred years of Christ Jesus with his very words. And I'll go a step further than this. Mm -hmm. The equivalent to what we Muslims have in the first century of the Hijra, that's the seventh century CE roughly, mm -hmm. compared to what the Christians have, is that we have something within that first century that you don't have until four centuries later. Okay, I'd like to address yes. that because that's a common claim and it's false. If you okay. take, yeah, it's, no, 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 I'm, I'm going to just say it's, it's actually false. Because mm -hmm. if you take the citations in the Apostolic Fathers, most of which were compiled within 75 years of Christ, 80% of the gospel text can be found in their writings. Okay, so can that, I repeat that, that point? Could I address uh, it? That is no, actually it wrong. Sense. Yep, yep, you that, you you're saying yeah, that there's, these texts I'm, aren't I'm there. going to respond. Let me respond to that one point. Sure. That is actually a false claim because I'm, you don't have a single manuscript of any of the writings of the Ch uh, church fathers before the Council of Nicaea. I'm yeah, going to make it I'm, even I'm gonna, easier for you. I'll make it wait, easier wait, wait, for wait, wait. you. Now it's about time I'll make it easier. Allow me to counter, please, because the Sermon no, I didn't finish my counter. is over I'm 40 sorry. years after the death I of the I didn't prophet. finish my so counter. You're making up stories and I, making up counter stories. Sorry, I didn't finish my counter of you, right? Uh, no, just, no, just one no. second. Joseph, Joseph, let, let's try to have a conversation. You'll be given op an opportunity to address uh, what Ijaz is saying. But let, let's have a meaningful conversation. We can agree to disagree at the end, if that's the case. But let him let he just finish his point. And yeah. we'll, and it's I'll just a to counter to his counter. And, and, I'll, and I'll try to make back. sure that... Well, yeah, you're, you're I mean, as right. long as I can counter back, I think it's not, not, yeah. not, not a problem, Joseph. So he just please finish your point. Yes. And then we'll... So very quickly, Joseph, my response to you is that there is no New Testament that you can re-establish merely with the writings of the church fathers because the church fathers paraphrase the text. Secondly, the writings of the church fathers as they survive in manuscript form before the 4th and 5th century CE is almost non-existent, I think, for other than two manuscripts. And you can check for me the Leverkusen database of ancient books and see that for yourself. The last thing is the Edico, uh, Ed, uh, Editio Critica Mayor in which it does use the writings of the church fathers and it does uh, develop a collation for us. It does not list the writings of the church fathers first, second, or third. I think it's actually the fourth thing cited when trying to determine the authority of a variant unit in the biblical text. So please, what's your counter to that? Okay, well, first off, we have to unpack that. Um, the fact that there have been variants that have been accepted by different church fathers, because there are differences even in the church fathers on what variants they accept. And most of the time they accept both in some form or another. That said, uh, the idea that the church fathers didn't weren't recordable until the fourth century is nonsense. Um, these were public figures that were well known, martyred, and had a lot of documentation concerning them. Uh, the idea that the church fathers were some kind of invented uh, thing at the Council of Nicaea is ridiculous. We have, as for the canon of scripture, we have the Moratorian fragment, which shows us within a hundred years the general canon of the books of the New Testament. So I, I don't think that any of the points that you made hold up to serious scrutiny, particularly if you're claiming that the basically there was nothing to verify the scriptures by the fourth century. That, that that's ludicrous, because even the sources you do find in the 2nd and 3rd century clearly indicate that it is the scriptures are being used as scriptures. They wouldn't say that if that wasn't happening. Uh, do you see what I'm saying? It's like, it would be like saying, like, from what I understand, the Quran is, was transmitted through reciters, correct, until it was finally put down on paper uh, after certain battles, etc. I think you would accept. That's not really, it was not... How did Muhammad write it? He 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 literally recited it. Am I right? And then people okay, repeated so it. Can I counter your claim then? So you made two big mistakes. I did not say that the church fathers were not recordable. I'm saying to you, in terms of extant manuscript evidence beyond the fourth and fifth century, before that, I think we only have one or two manuscripts for the writings of the church fathers. And I gave you the database of ancient books where you can go and type in the name of any church father to get their earliest extant manuscript. Secondly, I didn't make the claim. Maybe you misunderstood or you weren't aware. I'm not saying to you that the church fathers uh, were written on in the uh, Council of Nicaea. 
That's not the claim I'm making. I'm giving you a time of reference. That's 325 is within the fourth century. And the 400s will be the fifth century. Between the fourth and fifth century CE, we don't have, I, that's when we begin to see extant writings of the church fathers. My point simply is that you cannot reconstruct the New Testament on the basis of the Antonician church fathers because they primarily paraphrase the scripture. You will never get something that resembles the ECM as we have it now, or the NA28, or the UBS5. It will not resemble it whatsoever, which is why they've not been able to recreate it using those references after the Antonician Fathers. So after the 4th and 5th century, yes, you can largely reconstruct it, but something post that time period. But please, what is your counter to that? My counter to that would be that the idea that there was no extant understanding of a New Testament uh, until the Council of Nicaea is flawed. There are count. Okay, that you're shaking your head. What am I missing here? Uh, yeah, that's have, not my claim. Okay, then what is your claim? Let's okay, clarify so that. I don't you. want to in introduce this to a counter you with your time to counter. I'm simply saying that's not what I'm saying to you. What you understand the New Testament to be. Mm -hmm. What we call the archetypal text is not something that can go back beyond the third or the second century CE. This is the point that textual what do you mean criticism. By archetypal text. Okay, so in textual criticism, there is the published text, which at some point becomes the mother copy to all other surviving texts. So this is different from the orthographic text or the Osgang's text, which is the original text. You have the uh, Osgang's text, then you have the archetypal text. So most of the New Testament papyri today, and at least the Uncial codices, give us a archetypal text that takes us back to the third or second century CE. I believe Eldon Epp uh, wrote about this, um, uh, the latest right. ECM publication, so this can update you on that. I, so yeah, I, what's your comment? Right, my counter that, to that would be that the new, perhaps one can make that argument for the New Testament as a unified text, but the New Testament isn't unified text. It's 27 different um, pieces of literature, four Gospels and a series of epistles, which do have a traceable history individually. The, the New Testament, about, you're shaking your heads, guys. If I have to turn on my camera so I can nod my head, I will. No, but Joseph, but the point is that, you know, Joseph, one of the problems that I find with these type of discussions is that there seems to be a cognitive dissidence between Christians and Christian scholars. Well, when you say Christian scholars, I I'm mean, talking about that? academics. I'm talking right. about people who go to church, who believe in the crucifixion, they believe in the resurrection, they believe in the Bible, but when they write their academic works, and I've just listed a few mm -hmm. here, when they list their academic works, they're very clear mm -hmm. that that the that the bit that sorry, I beg your pardon, I put the wrong quote up. When they when they yes, here we go. Um, when they when they quote um, the Bible. The cloak, they, they quote the, the scriptures that are found within the Bible. Can I, they, can I, they, um, they widely agree, they widely agree. Can, can, can we, we put that quote that up for do. just a second? Sorry, can we put that quote back up for just a second? Uh, yes, we can do. Sure, <clears throat> I really would appreciate it because you are correct in that modern biblical criticism is largely based on atheism. Because I can actually go down this list. Bart Ehrman stopped believing in God approximately 10 years ago, and now, after many years of, he gained a great fan base in the Doha world by claiming that Jesus wasn't historical. Now he admits, okay, he was probably historical. Raymond Brown is was a Jesuit scholar who, once again, does not believe in the basic principles of the truth in the scriptures. John Dominic Crossan got an award for his modernism and believed that Jesus' body was eaten by wild dogs. Bruce Metger, uh, another atheist, the other two guys, I don't know about, but the point yeah, but, is liberal modernism, the they're not look, our people. They're, yeah, look, Joseph, just, Joseph, mm -hmm. Joseph, but here's the thing. Mm -hmm. Amongst the Christian academics, there are those who are churchgoers as well. They believe in Christianity. But the point is this, but Joseph, the point here is this. If an atheist writes a critique about Islam mm -hmm. and he writes a critique about the Quran, 
Okay. I don't look at his atheism or his believing in God or not believing in God as the criteria to judge the evidence that he brings forward. The evidence has to stand in its own by its own merit by its own self. Now, oh, of course, if if whilst um, um, Bar Ehrman is debating with Christian scholars out there who believe the Bible is actually preserved, they believe okay. that actually it is the word of God. Okay then they have to provide their counter evidence in order to counter the claims made by Bart Ehrman or these academics that you don't seem to like very much. Well, no, but, but I mean... But I, Joseph, I, here's the problem, yeah. Joseph. The problem is when we see these debates, when we see these dis discussions, the evidence always seems to be on side of the, the critique who are critiquing the preservation of the Bible. And when they cite evidences, when they show you manuscript evidence where certain things don't exist prior to a particular century, and then suddenly they seem to pop into the Bible, when they can make comparisons with the oldest complete Bible that we have, for example, the Codex Sinaiticus mm -hmm. and the modern day Bibles that we hold in our hands. Mm -hmm. And when they, they make comparisons of all the different Bibles that we currently have and how they differ in endings of Mark or this, that or the other, or, or level numbers of chapters, etc., etc., or even verses that are different oh, in well, different ours, to be in fair. Different, in but, different Bibles, like for example, First John five seven, which has been omitted from right, all. Right, wait, them. hold on. There's too many points we have all to address saying, here. That, no, no. All I'm saying to you is that that plethora of of evidence that is provided to show that corruption, if you have counter evidence, then you have to bring it forward. I haven't seen it. Okay, well, this is. I think that you're making a. First off, that's a valid point. Unfortunately, most of those points can also be applied to Western academics who study Islam. I think you'd agree with. But that's me. irrelevant. But, but no, no, no. But I'm, I'm not. I'm not making, right. I'm going to address your point. I'm simply stating. I'm going to address your point. I'm simply stating that that's kind of a universal. We all know that liberal modernists like to reductio ad absurdum to the point where. Not, and nothing has meaning. Whether it's the Bible, whether it's the Quran, nothing has meaning. It can all be explained out i'll tell uh, you why that's the wrong comparison joseph i i can i I'll explain like to you, I'll, I'll explain I want, to you. I think i'm actually going to answer your point like yeah, no that's I, fine but you've just okay. made the point here's a good, here's a good point a modern yeah. scholarship refers to saint dionysius of uh of you know saint dionysius the Areopagite as pseudo dionysius they ascribe to him that his writings were written seven centuries later a fantastic book was written on the life of St. Dionysius here, just this year, where they go through the arguments that modern scholars use and determine that ultimately it was most likely a first century document with a first century origin. Most of the claims most of likely, academics... Most likely based on what evidence? But if you use the evidence based on modernness and it's just as bad, what does it matter? If you can't, no. like, if you're but saying that cross is a rep reputable Christian scholar, Joseph, and he's claiming Jesus was eaten by wild dogs right. with no Joseph, evidence of a body. Jo jo Joseph, this is why I believe it's a false comparison. Mm -hmm. Because we, we we have no issue with the uh, atheist, agnostic, or Christian, or any other academic for that matter, who wishes wishes to challenge the Quran. We have no issue with them trying to challenge Islam or challenge the Quran. Bring it on. We have no issue with that whatsoever. We will provide our evidence. They can provide their evidence, and the, and hopefully the people, if they are fair and and just and balanced, will go wherever the evidence takes them. So when Brew Baker wrote, wrote his shoddy one hundred page book about apparently variants of the Quran, Brother Ijaz, uh, Farid, and um, who was the third person, Brother Mansur, they they wrote they wrote a three hundred page rebuttal to that book, providing actual manuscript evidence, photographs of folios, etc., et to defeat the claim. So the evidence is what matters. It doesn't matter because they're secular or they're this or they're that. So we, so the comparison is false. We're prepared to have those discussions with those people. I we're believe prepared, we're, we're yeah. prepared to have those challenges. But here's the thing you see, Joseph, whenever I've seen Bart Ehrman against any one of these Christian, uh, Christian he scholars. He doesn't deal with us. He deals, he deals with other Protestants. Nevertheless, he talks about biblical accuracy, biblical text. He provides his evidence. He provides the photographs of the fragments. He provides the variations that are currently existing. Uh, there doesn't seem to be a there doesn't seem to be a coherent evidence backed, evidence based argument to counter things. I, I would disagree. I would say that there are lots of responses to Bart Ehrman from many different sides of the discussion. 
And um, unfortunately, we have to look at those as well. Like, I don't assume that Bart Ehrman is right on a lot of things. As a matter of fact, I usually assume he's wrong on other things because people have critiqued him. Um, this becomes a thing where it's like a selective choice of scholars. Like, if you have people who are known, uh, as you just mentioned, this Brubaker guy, for example, you had to write responses to him. Um, I didn't know who he was. Uh, but if I did, and I was using that as a response, you obviously would have three people responding. That's why I brought up the Dionysius example, because many modern scholars refer to him as pseudo-Dionysius, so they can discount his writings as a forgery. My point is that, yes, there are counters, but we, when we present them selectively is where we have problems that pop up. And I think that that's the, the bigger issue. But I do have one more so, weird Joseph, question. Do you, I, believe, I like do you believe that the Bible is the inerrant word of God recorded verbatim as God revealed it to Jesus? Is that what your belief is? No. Uh, I believe that the Bible is the inerrant word of God that was recorded through people by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And do you believe that those recordings are identical? Uh, no, because they come across space, time. We're talking about different countries, different uh, languages, different people. So, uh, and we're talking about very fallible systems of writing and copying. Right. Uh, and do so, they sometimes contradict each other? Um, when you say contradict each other, you mean in terms of like the essence of what they mean? Like, is this the thing about like Jesus sitting on two horses or something like that? Like that, that's, that's nonsense stuff. A, co a contradiction is a, and not a, Right, I understand that, but then it can be as simple as Jesus sitting on two horses. No, no, case. I'm saying, look, if you say that these words recorded were recorded by the inspiration of the God of God Almighty, yeah, mm -hmm. then then it would be reasonable for me to then say, therefore, it is impossible that any error or contradiction could creep into that process. Would you agree? No, because we're still dealing with fallible human beings. Okay, so therefore, so therefore, it cannot be the inspired word of God, then can it? I disagree completely. It's not inspired because of the fact that the text is preserved perfectly. It's inspired because the message is preserved perfectly. We can talk about minor issues, but the main thrust of the text, that God became man so that man might be saved, is very clear. The basics of everything on it are very clear. Arguing that Jesus was on a horse or two horses does not negate the fact that all the Bible, all the New Testament writers say that he arrived in yeah, Jerusalem. Joseph, isn't the message, isn't the message made, uh, made apparent to the people by the very words that describe it? Uh, clarify. If right. you say it doesn't change the message, but the words have been changed, I would say it is the very words that are going to guide the doctrine, the beliefs in the creator. And if those words have changed, then the message has changed, hasn't well, it? That depends on how you are perceiving the, the text, the, the text in terms of its transmission. Um, the idea, for example, that if we believed, uh, I believe that this is kind of the Islamic belief, and to some degree it's a Protestant belief, that the Holy Scripture being inspired by God came down to man and so the question of its textual preservation is important. What Orthodox Christians believe is that Christ laid his hands on the apostles and the Holy Spirit came down upon them and that formed the church, which is why the question of the apostolic fathers who were the successors of the apostles becomes so important. That community was a living and breathing community of people uh, who might have spelled things wrong. That doesn't mean that they, uh, that they were... The message was corrupted. Joseph, I think and, you're, being, you're being very charitable by saying they spelt things wrong as if somehow that was the limit of the errors and changes that they committed. Well, and, sure, I let well, one of I the mean, other brothers come in there, Imran and, and Ejaz, if you want to come back in there. And Jewish International, thanks for coming back. We'll try to get you back on uh, very shortly. Sorry, please. Dr. Imran, continue. Ejaz, continue. Joseph, please do continue with the other brothers. Yeah. Um, so Ejaz, you were having your discussion. Uh, was your discussion over, Ajaz? Uh, that, that's up to him because I think uh, he didn't get a chance to respond to my final point. So I forgot you, your final point. I'm sorry, things are uh, fast. I'm, I'm sorry, uh, 
Uh, I think it was uh, we saw in the words of the New Testament with the references from the church fathers Anton uh, uh, before Nicaea. Um, I think that's where you stopped. Well, I would say that this is a, I'd say that it's a continual process of learning. Um, and what I mean by that, for example, is that the church fathers referred to uh, the teaching of the apostles in a written form. But uh, between the 7th and 18th century, they kind of had to guess those until the discovery of the text of the Didache on Mount Athos in like 1847. But the point is, it still fit, and it was still, it actually did, was helpful. In some ways, things like Wednesday and Friday fasting, these were things that were in the Didache, they were things that were known in the oral tradition, but they didn't have written support. So it actually, the discovery of the Didache actually helps confirm the teachings that we had already held. So yeah, I, could I, I just put, yeah. yeah, just about one point. Yeah, I don't know if it was on this stream. It may have been a different stream. I, I own a copy of a critical edition of the DDK. Uh, we've gone through it uh, from the three main manuscripts of it. And I don't seem like the average Christian isn't aware, even if they, they're familiar with what the DDK is, mm -hmm. they're not aware of how late the manuscripts are, including, I think, one from the ninth century. There's only, I think, two of them which carry the vast volume of the text. I can look it up in a second and mention it again, but that's basically the point. Wow. That it might confirm some of your teachings, and for us, that will be considered for the first 800 years of Christianity. But I'll leave it there to make your final point. Uh, so go ahead. Okay. Well, I mean, the te the Didache text uh, that we're, uh, we're talking about there, that one most likely, I'm, I think, is actually, that one is a late one, but it was a confirmation of a text that people were unsure of. Um, that said... Um, I didn't, I, well, let me, I was going to get to another question and this one I think is kind of, uh, kind of more important if we're, uh, one thing that, uh, I've kind of been asking of late, uh, because I know about, you know, things like the variants and things so on and so forth. Um, but I get the impression there is something separate in the kind of message of the Quran in the physical book. Is that correct? Or are they the same thing? No, we don't have we don't make this artificial distinction between words and message. Okay, so the the Quran, the physical book, is considered like, like, like it. It's considered like you know, physically like. Even with the variants, it's just. So I don't know what reference you're referring to because there's two different phenomena here. Mm -hmm. There's a claim that there was an original single. You're kind of breaking up. I, I, I don't quite hear you. Can anyone else hear me? Yeah, I hear you. Now you hear you. You can hear. Okay. So there's a there's a there's a two different concepts here that maybe you're trying to uh, align that I don't align. Trying to figure out. I, 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 I don't have like so, some organized attack. No, I understand. So let me just try and maybe help uh, part of the journey. So, so for, as far as I understand, Christians believe that there was, say, for example, the the Book of John. There was an there was one original writing of that. And then this was disseminated. As it was disseminated, it's, there had become changes within it, which is why we have variations within manuscripts that we find of that. That's just a very simple overview. Those you would call variants because there was one original, original and there were changes from that, whether it's omission, addition, subtraction, whatever that might Translation be. Translation error. Oh, yeah. what, whatever. That, that's, I'm just giving you the, the example. And now with Islam, I don't know what you mean by variants because actually we have... Um, we have the Quran being revealed in different modes of recitation mm -hmm. by the the Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him. So what that means is that we have uh, in from the very beginning we have these different modes of, uh, and it seems that the Christ, some Christians have discovered this now, and they and they're trying to sort of do the two toe policy where, you know, well we've got problems but you've got problems as well. It doesn't apply here. Why it doesn't apply? Because all of these go back to the Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him. Mm -hmm. now, the other thing is we haven't lost our oral tradition. In fact, the oral tradition is the primary mode of preservation. I would say, so, that that's and they complement. So, for example, if you found a, say, if you found a Quran somewhere that had something in it that wasn't in what Muslims would consider a Quran, we would say, "Oh, that's very interesting, wonderful, uh, wonderful discovery." This is not Quran. We're able to say that. Whereas, if as a Christian, if you were to find a, a, an older manuscript somewhere that had a variant reading, you'd have to try and assess. Which is how much weight do we give the value of this aberrant text, and try to sort of 
uh, combine it with what you have to bring. Well, well we, we compare it against other manuscripts. Yeah. So, so we didn't. We wouldn't have that problem because we know that this is not Quran. We would just simply look at it and go, "Yep, that looks wonderful." Not Quran, because why we have that preserved um, me memorization process. The oral tradition is preserved, plus we have the manuscripts as well. Well, I, I would say that that the oral tradition is what kept the basic body of what we call the New Testament today, um, what kept it kind of unified. Because the church was rejecting false gospels, we had to deal with the Marcionites who tried to take out the entire Old Testament. Um, the Gnostics were making up their own gospels about Jesus. You all heard about the Gospel of Thomas. But, but Joseph, the, the issue is, is that because you can't access this oral tradition, you can't access it in terms of you can't demonstrate what it was, you have to take guesses at it. From... Wait a second. No, no. I'm an Orthodox Christian priest. I represent that oral tradition. I, I, I'm, not, I'm not like just like referring to some hidden thing as oral tradition. Our oral tradition consists in the prayers and actions of our church. Okay, so the could, Eucharist. You recite, could, you, could you recite for me uh, some memory in the original language? What, no, what, I can't what, do anything from an original language. I speak what, English. What, what, so, but you're a, you're a representative of the tradition of handing this down orally, right? Yes, of the, of the tradition of the church. So not the texts. No, the texts okay, are so this the is, texts. So this is the this is the issue that we're having. Excuse me, one second. So what what you're what you're referring to is that we passed on our traditions, no problem. We're talking about the thing which you refer to as revelation from God, i.e., the 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 texts that were supposed to represent the words of Jesus, peace upon him, uh, or those texts that were revealed specifically to the people who you, who are who claim to have written the New Testament. That, that, for me, would be something I'd be interested to hear. But because you're not able to represent that, this is what I mean by that you don't have access to... But this is a problem. That, that, that's kind of... You're creating a standard that I wouldn't necessarily... I wouldn't hold sure, to but the that's our, I'm, I'm not creating... What I'm saying is, this is our standard. Right. Our standard is we have a tradition that you can go to a Chinaman uh, or a Chinese child who will read for you in Arabic the original revelation of the Quran, who will read it to you from memory. There, okay. are, there are millions, in the tens of millions of people who okay. have, have this process. Now, that's a direct preservation of the original revelation in its language, so we, we, there's no way that can be lost. So we have direct right. access to that. Now, that verification process is simply missing from Christianity. What, I would, I would what argue you, that, it's, that, that you're I looking understand. for the wrong what thing. What you refer to is that you have your traditions Mm -hmm. And when I asked you, do you mean that by that the text? You you know you said no. No, the text is part of in... the tradition, but the idea that I have it fully memorized is not because that is not. So how... then, in, in which way then are you representing the tradition? Okay, well I can answer that question. Uh, when Christ, as you know, walked the earth, he gave his disciples, you know, the power of the Holy Spirit. We know that from Acts, and he gave them duties to baptize the nations. He gave them duties to perform the mystery of his word, uh, the Eucharist, which is all in the first centuries, and to build a perpetual succession that would remain until the end of time to remain as his body. So in other words, this was a message that could go even to illiterates. This is part of the reason, if you notice, there's an icon behind me. The reason why is because many of the people were illiterate. The messages that we were sending were for everybody. And I can only imagine that if it was only the literates who could attain salvation, uh, that would be terrifying. Because oh, so this, is, this is interesting. Because I would look at the icon behind you and wonder uh, what, what was the what was the second commandment all about. And, uh, and I would so, say that's about yeah, idols. I yeah. understand. So what what we're having here is a, there's a you're talking you're claiming that there are um, certain traditions that have been passed on from the beginning, mm -hmm. and you can hold on to the rituals and the traditions. That's no problem. But where but the the, the, then at the same time, you're claiming this is based in somehow the text that was passed on. Now, no, not just that. No, I'm saying the text. Um, the text ask, acts as a witness to what was passed on. That's the so human with, the, the side is, 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 is the, the tradition. So the, the the problem here is is that the, the we're testing the witness. Okay. The witness is that is which we're being tested. Mm -hmm. That we I because I, I don't have access to the claim of this sort of uh, traditions being passed on. Um, I because you because there's no there's no as far as I know there's no you haven't you haven't presented any evidence of a a chain of 
learning or teaching that's been passed on unbroken that you can point us to. Well, I mean, I, 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 I can do that with time. It would just oh, take me no a little problem. while. Let me just finish my thought. So we're referring to the text because that is your witness. And the witness is not able to stand up to scrutiny. And that's the issue that well, we're having. Well, I would disagree that the witness yeah, is not I, I able. Like, it, gonna, we can't take it a priori. Well, sure. You can't take it a priori that the witness is not a valid testimony. So this, so um, it's not a priori. Uh, you did this previously when you were talking to Abbas. You started talking about donkeys, and he didn't mention donkeys. Well, yeah, well, no, that, that's that's a common argument I've heard. Yeah, so that's not an argument that was being made. And okay. uh, no one has made an argument that we're taking this a priori. In fact, you were given lots and lots of reasons why this was the case. Well, I would, I, I mean, I would say that, that, that the whole discussion started whether uh, testimony is reliable or not. So I, I can't say that I would agree that uh, this it wasn't brought up. They, it, it, we started the very discussion that we think with each other, with each other about how the Quran can be narrated, can be referred to as reliable as a standard, and the Bible is not. So I'm, it's not that I'm trying to, um, I'm not trying to like you know, for lack of a better word, just discount what you're saying on the matter. No, I'm not saying, what I'm saying is that. I'm saying that the perspective. Uh, is I think in in our discussion here it's it's actually showing here. For example, if I were to ask you, what is the basic message of the Bible or the New Testament in one sentence, or what is the basic message of the Quran in one sentence? Can you make that distinction? Because to me, I think I can. I'm just wondering if you can. So the, the, this is the problem here now. So the, and and, the, and I'm glad you alluded to that because what what you do is you claim a witness. Mm -hmm. that we can't verify. I, I will say why we can't verify because we don't have access to either a chain of memorizers who have memorized it from the beginning in the original language, or we don't have access to manuscripts that go without a gap that would allow us to assert that this is the original. Um, mm -hmm. e even if referring to the uh, the Apostolic Fathers, uh, they don't they don't make exact quotes, and their quotes often they make of the same thing in different wordings in different places. You can you don't have to take my word for it. You can check that. But the the problem here is is that you are shifting from. Uh, the focus on do we have the words that were revealed to oh it's just it's it's a, a message a very fuzzy stand not fuzzy at all out of, i would i would say that it's very fuzzy and out of How focus is it fuzzy I'll, I'll explain it to you it's a fuzzy and out of focus way of trying to assert that there is um uh, that everything is still clear and and the, and the, it's easy to do just look at the fact that the ecumenical councils were going on for centuries mm -hmm. after apparently that the bible was available to people yeah because there was a not there was no clarity about which positions we should take whether that be on the nature of jesus peace be upon him or the the nature of the Holy I mean, spirit are we are, now, are we really going to play the the kind of the heretical game because i you know that there which are heretic, variant, which, which heretical because game? if we're talking about the council of nicaea the arians were a sect um that broke up they did have imperial power so when, did they become, when did they become heretics when they spouted heresy, what? No, when? Obviously, that's a tautology. They yeah, became well, heretic when they spouted tautology. Just like saying the, the, the assumption one and you're one making is, here is that they do no. The assumption I'm asking you're, you when? Why would you invite heretics to an ecumenical council? Uh, because an ecumenical council is an imperial council. They had to be judged. That's why the, the empire at that point was Christian. So it became their civil responsibility to have to hear out both sides. Did the church know who was guilty? Absolutely. But they didn't have the legal power of being the state. So these were, so you, now I'm, so let me understand you, what you seem mm -hmm. to be saying. You can tell me if I'm misunderstanding you. Sure. You're saying the state made rulings on what was Christian doctrine and not Christian doctrine. I'm saying that the state in this particular case had to, um, they had to referee effectively uh, what the church was fighting with, with the heretics because it was okay. affecting so why, property. Why was, there a, why was there a fight if it was already clear? Because when, because anyone can make up a heresy and if they're charismatic enough, they can carry people around. This happens everywhere. I, you can't tell me that that's not true in Islam. You can't tell me that there are no sects of Islam outside of the Sunnah. That's not true. We know no, that. The problem here is, is that the problem here is, is that there's an evidence-based discussion. Now, right. that, what you have, what you have in the ecumenical councils, they're actually deciding, deciding on the nature of. That's Christ. not true. I disagree completely. Uh, if you actually read the text of the Acts of the Ecumenical, because they have these. I, they're large legal documents of hundreds of pages of the actual testimonies of 
the heretics and of the Orthodox, they're very, very clear. They're not deciding what the truth is. Both sides believe they have the truth, but the Orthodox are able to present that their truth goes back to the Apostles, whereas Arius was an innovator. And it, was, it, it wasn't it was solved with Nicaea either. It took another hundred years. It wasn't, it wasn't solved, absolutely. Sorry, brother, right. Josh, put your hand up. You yeah. were... Sorry, uh, just for Joseph so I can understand. Are you saying <laughs> that you think the Council of Nicaea was fair to the position of Arius? And if so, what was the, the division between the fathers, sorry, the presbyters? What was the division on the number of people that took the later uh, the, the non avias claim versus the avian claim. Okay. Like, do you know what? Yeah, uh, what I would say is this. Uh, when Arius first made his claim, and you actually see this in history repeatedly with other major heresies and other councils, when Arius first made his claim, the church's general reaction was with horror. Um, because when he said there's a time that Jesus was not, that was the moment when people fled the churches that where he had associates saying the same thing. They were started to reorganize. The Arians used state power against the Christians. Um, the Christians responded by using state power against the Arians. So we, we, I would say that once the heresy was stated, it caused enough of a reaction um, that it would cause horror. I, I think that that's, I think that that's a natural reaction. Yeah, but you didn't answer my question, right? At the Council of Nicaea, mm -hmm. the presbyters, the elders, invited to debate this topic. Right? How mm -hmm. many of them were non Arians as compared to Arians? Um, well, that's uh, you have to go by the total number of attendees. I, I want to say it was yes. something like 400. Uh -huh. um, that said, uh, even in the meetings proceedings, you have people who were like, I'm on Arius' side, and then by the end of it, they're like, Oh, no, 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 I'm on the church's side, I condemn him too. So you had people changing their minds because on the face of evidence, they realized, wait, I don't want to be associated with this side. So, so, Joseph, what I, what I would point out is that there's a point to my question, which mm -hmm. I don't think you... I, I think you think you're answering it, but I'm saying that you aren't. Because I'm, I'm trying from, to the, from the side of the Arians, just to mm -hmm. be clear here, the vast majority of the people invited were non arian And we look at what happened after that particular council and mm -hmm. we just move it a little bit further to the one of Rimini Salusia, which your church does not recognize. Mm -hmm. The numbers tell us that they adopted Arius' Avia, position at that council. Yeah, right? that, so that's they, exactly so, what happened with the Monophysites right. as well. And it happened back, and this went back and forth until mm -hmm. about 381. Right. So the thing is, by fiat in 381, was the decision at Nicaea re ratified? I think it's under Theodosius II. Yeah. And so, Theodosius. Yeah. Right. So at that point, it was not the the beliefs of the people that made the decision. There was an individual with that power to make that decision of what should be considered orthodox, right? No. because uh, the, the we, we we've just gone through the first off with those first two in, uh, ecumenical councils, you had imperial sanction on them, and the other councils that we were referring to did not have that. But there were also cases where councils that were heretical, uh, the Iconoclast Council of Yeria had imperial sanction. Um, the point is, imperial sanction alone does not determine truth. Truth determines truth. Um, just like uh, Imran said, you know, you can tell something when you look at it is not Quran. That's the point. We say something, uh, something's yeah. not the church. That's I get that. it is. But you disagree with me, and I don't understand your disagreement, which is. We know that this question of areas versus non area Aryan versus non Aryan beliefs ended by 381, ended, largely ended. I want to put the question to you what did Theodosius II do and the people after him do to, to churches that identified themselves as Aryan? Um, oh, well, it depends if they were in the environs of the Roman Empire, if they were condemned. Uh, their churches would be given over to the Orthodox. They would not be allowed to keep the properties because those properties were also considered part of the Christian state. Uh, I would not say, however, that Arianism died in 381. That's not true. Um, it just moved. So, like, it moved into certain areas of Spain where it lasted until the 6th century. Uh, it moved into um, I don't, some I don't areas of Italy. 
Yeah, yeah I, do, I don't agree. I think there was such a minor, like, sh- uh, relic of a group at that point. I can't consider they them had the alien. whole of Spain, like the, the like the, the whole of like. The, I, is, I mean, you if you know about the Yuma, you I know. Of it, I, you I understand. Know that, I, I'm just saying to you. Here, here, here are the words I'm saying to you: that Aryan belief at that point was pretty much a relic of itself from the one in the fourth century CE. Oh yeah, because it had lost ground, it had lost space. That's true, um, and that. But then, again. History is so, funny that so way. You, uh, you do see then that the, when I asked the question in a sli- slightly different way, you understood it correctly and you agreed yeah. with me with what well, I was I saying. I agree with so you on that. Let because... me finish the point. So, okay, okay. So, so when I am asking the question, if I can do that, let me just finish the question, then you can uh, give me that answer. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah, please go ahead. Yeah. Oh, no, yeah, I was giving ahead. you the point yeah. to answer, yeah. to go on. No, you answered my question. Oh, okay. okay. All right. Okay. Well, the whole point I was trying to make is that it's uh, one of these weird facets of history because we simply we're in unprecedented times. I think you would you we would you would agree with that, and that's just looking at things historically. In the sixth century, for example, and I say this all the time on my show, in the sixth century, um, an historian would have thought that the church, his church, the you know the Church of the East, had was the Church of Time Eternal and was the big because they were the biggest at that time. They had extended from, uh, you know, anywhere from Antioch and Jerusalem all the way to China. So, you know, from their perspective, they were on top. They were like the Roman Catholics of our day. But power dynamics shift, and they shift often. Um, I mean, you can see this in the Muslim world. It's completely different than it was 100 years ago when, you know, the last um, the last caliphate fell. Um, and so, you know, the point is, history changes things. And so, yeah, there's... There's a reason for that, but truth doesn't change. So even in cases where the church was a minority, she still held the truth, and that would work itself out over time. That I like work. this. You you said that the truth stays the same. Did right. I understand you correctly? Yeah. Okay. All right. So then, like like to Abraham or to to Noah to to Isaiah, maybe these three prophets. Right. Mm-hmm. I don't know if you consider them to be prophets. No, we do. Um, we have icons okay. of them too. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So these. These were monotheists. Do you believe that they were Trinitarian in any way? Uh, yes, I do. I, but not, uh, I believe it was abstractly so, because I would say that the Old Testament church had not experienced the fullness of revelation. But when they had experienced God, he was usually triune. For example, uh, the three angels meeting at the Oak of Mama. Genesis 18. Yeah, yeah. They, right. So the not, point, I, there were shadows of it, but it wasn't but, fully explained. Yeah. So I'm not asking about the scripture itself. I'm saying... The historical men that Abraham, Moses, uh, well, any three prophets that you want, we can't say that God told them that he was Trinitarian, that his identity is Trinitarian. Well, I mean, he always referred to himself as we, so that's the first thing, and we can but, argue about the royal we, etc. But the point is that what I'm getting at is that, um, you know, God generally speaks in singular in the Old Testament. Um, but however, this is a good point you, that you made, though. Yeah. Sorry, good point. You said that God referred to Himself as a we. What would do you think that had Abraham, Moses, uh, David, any of these prophets taught, actually taught that, hey, I think that this God could be more than one entity in some way, in some abstract yeah, way? Yeah, some that, abstract sense. Yeah, that, because otherwise, that, otherwise, yeah, Isaiah doesn't make sense. Uh, yeah, right. That, that's the point I'm getting to. It wouldn't make sense. So. This is not a teaching of the identity of God that the earlier patriarchs would have had. And the thing is, when God communicates his identity, we believe his identity does not change. But it seems to me that there's a shift for the Christian, right? Mm -hmm. Because Christ has to teach that God is diverse in some way, right? So, like, since you understand the Bible well, well, that he's not absolutely one. Well, he is, he is one. We, we, I'm not I speaking of the nature. I'm speaking of the entities that would make up the persons without using the same persons. Okay. I'm trying to say that Jesus, being that gap, would have had to teach people this distinction. It was not something that you could by yourself discern. Right. And, that, so and, like, that say, and he does that, and that's part of the reason why they yeah. try to stone him multiple times. So, so what I want to ask is, if you were to choose any of the four Gospels, right, but choose any of them. Where do you see Jesus 
helping the, his disciples or the crowds following him understand that God has diversity to him in a way that they could not perceive without being polytheists? Huh. Um, I would say that at the time, uh, God, he, he does it by example. Um, and what I mean by that is he confronts them with the reality that he is the son of God which is blasphemy in their world. They, they, they understand that to be blasphemous if somebody suddenly claims to be God's son. And so the repeated attempts he has to explain, like when he says, before Moses was, I am, he is literally claiming divine sonship for himself. They know that, and that's why they pick up stones to throw at him. And so... Uh, I disagree with that, just so you know. Uh, I don't think... think I, I'm, yeah, I'm speaking... Yeah, I'll get to that, but I'm speaking... Not of the Jews which opposed him. I asked you about the disciples and the crowds following him, the ones who already believed what this man said. So at some uh, point, these uh, rural Jews, these rural Jews from Capernaum, Galilee, all of these areas, how did Christ teach them that there is a plurality to God, a diversity in a way that does not reflect polytheism? Right? Because what we see, we don't see that transition. Right. Well, first off, I doubt that. Um, I think that they would under, they would have had a very different understanding of polytheism at the time. They would have associated it with uh, Greek polytheism, and they wouldn't have claimed that Jesus was claiming himself in the pantheon. So we have to understand that the the Jewish people, or I should say Judea, or uh, the Old Testament Church at that time, understood um, that God was not an absolutely simple being. But at the same time, they also knew what blasphemy was. And so I would say that what happened was that you mentioned the Jews that were speaking out to condemn him. And then there were those that... No, not, yeah, right. the ones that you, followed, making, I believe. Right. You're making a distinction between those two, which is fair. However, my answer would be that at the time of the crucifixion, most of even those Jews who believed in him in Capernaum, so on and so forth, turned on him at the crucifixion. They believe they held to the idea that he was a blasphemer. And in fact, so central was the idea of the rebuilding of the temple, of the resurrection, that it was the resurrection itself that brought these people back because now they realize, wow, he was telling the truth after all. Okay, so you're saying that the answer to the question is these people realized there was a plurality to God at the time of the resurrection. Mm, yeah, they realized that he truly was, you know, the uh, okay. son of God, the son of God. Okay, so so you, this wouldn't lead us to the Trinity, but more to a duality. Uh, yeah, it, yeah, and that the Trinity really, I think, and remember, Trinity is more of a formalized term, is something that we start seeing developed at places like Nicaea. Uh, yeah. The divinity of the Holy Spirit, uh, or the Spirit of God, um, which you do find in the Old Testament, there's certainly more, I would say there's more evidence in the Old Testament for the Holy Spirit than there is uh, as more as much as there is for a future Messiah. So the whole point is because the Spirit of God acts, you know, that is the Holy, that you see in the OT, is the old is the Holy Spirit of the New Testament, but it's not totally revealed to be a person until like you see like the baptismal verses, like baptize them in the name of the Father and the Holy Spirit. But certainly by the time of the Apostolic Fathers, they did understand so that the Apostles clearly told them that this was Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So, so let let's work with that. Then let's work okay. with that. Yeah. Just just a quick question, and then the brothers can proceed out to follow here. This is a great so, discussion, by so, the way. I really appreciate so, yeah. it. Likewise, right? So we understand then that it was really the act of the resurrection that took them from absolute divine simplicity, absolute monotheism, as maybe they would understand it at that point, to a duality, and then that it was fleshed out at the time of the Apostolic Fathers, which would be the first, second, third, would you say fourth century? At no, that point? At, that, at that point, that's the pre-Nicene Fathers. Okay. Apostolic okay. Fathers. Okay. Are, okay. Right. okay, I understand. Pre -Nicene. Pre -Nicene. Okay. The Apostle. Yeah. okay, good. So we're saying up until the early fourth century CE, right? So the thing is, if this was the truth, I don't think there had to be a period where absolute monotheism a binitarianism of some kind, and then finally a period of uh, Trinitarianism, right? Th that transition seems to be outside of the hands of Jesus and to be something more of humans wrestling to understand 
actuality in God. And so for us as the Muslim, I, we go back to the point that you said earlier that the truth doesn't change. The truth is the truth. You've given us steps of the change of that truth, of God is unipersonal to multipersonal, and you just explained that it took maybe a couple hundred years. For me, that shows that Trinitarianism is not the truth. And the average Muslim here would say to you, the identity and the qualities of my God has not changed. And even if it is that we don't understand the very essence of God, the very basic identity of him we recognize. Mm -hmm. I don't think you can say that for yourself compared to the Jewish God that Abraham, Moses, David would have known. I'm glad that you brought that up because I was about to. Um, one thing that we do want to we do want to clarify because obviously when the church was formed, that was a schism in Judaism, and the uh, rabbinic system began to be developed. Really, Pharisaism. This is all really first century. So we would argue that we represent as the church the the preservation of the temple whereas they lost it in 70 AD. That said, um, if you look at what rabbinic Judaism teaches about God, um, they often refer to him in multiple entities. They see him as a plurality often, and sometimes they don't even define it. Sometimes it's one, sometimes it's three, sometimes it's 12. Um, so the point is, they don't even have that concept of this hard unity. They had a concept of, God being somewhat difficult to explain. And in that sense, Christianity, because God manifested himself on earth, was able to make things more clear. And through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit over the apostles and fathers, they're able to clarify better. So that's our position. So from our position, we don't see it as change, but clarification. But that clarification is a change to the identity. No, we would say it's not. We would say that it was always originally there, but it was not fully expressed. Oh, this is my point. Okay, let's take that word and just run with it. Not fully expressed. Mm -hmm. The thing is, do you think Christians have more clarity understanding God is three versus a Muslim understanding that God is absolutely one? Yes. Okay, you, wait, so repeat your answer to that question. Yes. You have more clarity of who God is in the three persons that a Muslim would have in God who is absolutely one. Absolutely. Okay, great. What's the sacred name of God? Uh, I am. That's the one we've been handed down. Uh, Ahya Asher Ahya is, is not I am. I'm not asking you for the translation in Exodus 3.14. I know, because there's no yeah. way to do that. There, there, there's no vowels. Okay, all right, I, so am let me ask I am is what has been given to us by our Lord to use. That's what he uses in the New Testament. Egoini in Greek. Uh, but, but the whole point is the whole point is that is the name that he's allowed for us. Just to be clear, that's that wouldn't be the sacred name. The sacred name would have to be composed of Yod He Vav He. The Greek equivalent of Exodus three fourteen would not be ego aimi. It would be ego aimi ho on, which I think the Septuagint uses. And the you see that is, as the icon, which is why they have the o on. I, I I understand that, but I'm saying to you, the sacred name of God cannot be pronounced. You don't have the vowels for right. Understood, yes? You don't have the sacred name. Okay, so uh, Dr. Imran, what's the sacred name of God in Islam? Well, we know Allah. that. So, yeah. mm -hmm. Sorry, Dr. Imran, I didn't hear you. Allah. He said Allah. Yeah, Allah, right? So when we speak of understanding God better, any random Muslim knows the sacred name of God, but they're Christian. But not just one, not just two, but three persons, uh, mm -hmm. uh, 66 book Bible, uh, you're orthodox, so you don't agree with that, 73, 73, and you still don't know the sacred name of God. Well, I have a question for you, uh, sure. because obviously as a Muslim, you are part of a community of, I think, a billion people. Um, I'm not sure. When was the last time um, that you experienced a lot directly, physically, in your heart? Every single day. Every single day. How Every single day. Because it's something called salah. And just to be clear here, we distinguish between that which can be known intellectually and that which can be understood spiritually. We mm -hmm. do not say that individual uh, spiritual circumstances trump the revelation of God, which is set in stone, direct, and understood by his community. So no personal experience of mine can change who God is for me. The God of the Quran is the one I believe in. 
not the God of my personal making. Because right, that's we not do. what I asked you, though. What no, I but asked that's what was, you're trying to ask. Yes. No, no, I'm, I'm actually yes. asking, when did you physically come into contact with Allah? And you said, when you do Salat. I don't not, know what that is. Sorry, I would, we would never say the word physically come in contact. We say that we Muslims, when we establish our prayer five times a day, in the way that God has prescribed it and commanded it, we get that emotion, that feeling, that understanding. Some Muslims would use the term khushu. But this is what not is the khushu? basis of uh, taqwa, God, fear, and uh, uh, close. It literally means closeness with God okay. uh, or irreverence with God or of mm -hmm. God. So, so I'm not speaking about individual emotion here. Intellectually, in Revelation, God has told us what his name is. So I can know who he is by his sacred name. I would like to think if God would reveal himself in multiple persons in a long line of scripture, in Hebrew, Greek, and Latin, the least I would be able to have with him is know his sacred name. Okay. Um, my argument in response would be that, first off, he is revealed as Jesus Christ in the glory of God the Father. Christians do not simply experience things on a for lack of a better word, uh, kind of like a, a uh, literary certainty. Uh, what we experience things by is through the experience of Christ. We believe that when we are baptized, that we literally become part of the body of Christ. We experience God physically. So we experience God physically through the Eucharist. We experience God physically through the mysteries. So the reason I'm bringing this up, it's, uh, you know, one can argue that it's feelings. I disagree completely. It's action. I didn't put that up just so no, I, Okay, yeah, but I'm just saying, it's actions. It's not feelings. That's not, that was me. Yep. Well, you're wrong. Sorry. <laughs> anyway, the point is that it's actions. But, but just, just if they see the problem here is... You believe in a transcendent God? No, no. The, 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 prob the problem here is that people want to try to define God how they would like to define him what makes them feel good what makes them feel comfortable what sort of makes sense to them in their reality of what they've learned and what they but for, I, us, uh, for, for us that, joseph though? for us joseph it's what allah tells us about himself that is meaningful it's allah, allah tells us i'm closer to my to the believer than his jugular vein the jugular vein is found right here. I know where the jugular vein is. In the I'm just saying it. God knows how, how many I'm just saying it for the head. people yeah. that might not know necessarily. Right. right. Allah says that I'm closer to you. In other words, there is this intimate connection between Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his creatures and his creation. But we do not say of Allah that which Allah has not disclosed of himself. And Whatever befits Allah's majesty, that concept of him being closer to us than our jugular vein is within that within those boundaries and those concepts. But so, you know, the, the brother Abbas, the, yeah. the thing is that in response to not knowing the name of God, um, because you can't pronounce it because there's no vowels in it, your response to that to brother Ijaz was, we feel it. Well, and, because and, I was and the problem with that is the problem with that is that anyone who has feelings and makes claims about feelings, Hindus can make claims no. about feelings. Yeah, but the Buddhists can make people take DMT and they have all sorts of feelings uh, about right. Super, but hold on. But, uh, the problem the problem with that is is that it's a subjective internal state that you can't demonstrate to anybody else, and it doesn't well, answer the question of why has God saw fit not to? If you have this intimate connection, why has He not sought to give you His name? Okay, in and the first place, the, of, the issue that I, we're having. I'd like to address all those in order. Um, in many of the liturgical texts of the church, I'm going to go backwards. Uh, they actually list the names of God, um, in which case there are over 70. Um, but the point is that those are not all, they're not all used in the same way. He's called the door, but that we don't refer to God as the door in general. Before you continue, however, because you have pointed to my emotional individualism as opposed to what the collective teaching of the church has been for 2,000 years. No, no, sorry, like to, uh, sorry Frank. 
you pointed towards your emotional individualism. No, I didn't. I, I'll, I'll explain. One the, second, no, 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 and what I, you did for a specific to, reason once to saying that you don't know the name because you can't pronounce it because you don't have the vowels in response well, I was talking that, about the tetragram and that's a in, different in, thing in no, response yeah. to that you gave you gave this, yeah. it's our uh, uh, you asked the question uh, is there some sort of uh, do you have any way of physically contact and this is an emotional argument right no it's not you're bringing, it's bring, absolutely this, not that's false it's You're false brilliant. just because of the fact that it involves it's spirituality, it's emotional. It's an argument from personal experiences. No, it's not. It's an argument from and collective it doesn't experience. Answer, it doesn't answer the question. It doesn't There's a the reason question. because I had to establish a baseline to give you. And what I mean by this is this first off, it's silly to say that all physical interactions are by nature emotional. That's false. It's I never more, said this. So, well, so right, so if, I really would appreciate it. I really would appreciate it if. In making your statements, mm -hmm. you don't attribute things to me that I, I've never said anything you about. Said it was my emotional response. Yes, your emotional. It's not an but emotional. Not, I'm not response. talking about all emotional. You, you, you've taken my specific point and you've right. generalized it, and then generalizing it, you make the point false. Right, but what I'm, not saying, what I'm saying. So in this in the specific in the specific point that you made, mm -hmm. you were asked what is the name of God. You pointed yeah. to the tetragrammaton and you said you could not pronounce it. Well, I specifically word, right? started by saying so, Jesus Christ. In of response the to this, you the answer that you came out with was that's simple. We have a we have a, a, a some sort of physical connection every you know how, and it you was asked, a you asked this question, which there, doesn't there. answer the question. It doesn't right. answer the question. I was trying because I was okay. Let's get something straight here. What I was trying to do was establish a baseline, which I didn't get to finish, because my point was that the knowledge of a name as written down is different than the experience of personally interacting with the deity. I, I, let me put it to you this way. Let's say uh, you know John Brown around the corner, okay? Um, I've read John Brown's work. I know John Brown's teaching. You've met John Brown every day going to the store. You've talked to him at length. You have an understanding of John Brown that I will never have from reading the text. That was my point in bringing up the personal communication and physical interaction between God and man that becomes real with Christ. It was not to try to say that I know the names better. I don't. I don't even have them memorized. But what I will say is that the name that I know of, Jesus Christ, Son of the Father and the Holy Spirit, is the name I use. And it is the name he asked us to use. But most importantly, it's personal. Sorry, sorry, you're because you're, you're making. So first of all, the the analogy. I don't understand the analogy you gave. You, okay. You, I, I may have read the book. I may have read the book, but it doesn't. No, say you're the, the one name. who knew it, it that. Say, I it doesn't say the book. name. Yeah, so it doesn't say the name John Brown in it. It right. says it says J H N B R W N. It doesn't. I don't know how to pronounce the name because there are no vowels yeah. in it. Yeah. It could be E John Brown. It could be E John Brownie. It could be any. This is the. This was the question being asked about. Now the claim is, well, you know, I meet him every day. Well, it's great that you meet him every day. Did he tell you what his name was? Yeah, Father. Okay, there we go. So, Joseph, it's been wonderful talking to you. Likewise. Really, really this really has actually been nice. I really appreciate well, you guys. Please, uh, please come gonna, again. And I'll have more questions and they will probably go crazy. Okay. Joseph, you know All what right. it is, Joseph? We're, what we're calling you to is what we would argue is the religion of Abraham. I would argue that it's another religion, but I, well, it was good. Time. Well, the, the thing is, the thing is, Joseph, and it is quite surprising that even many of the Jewish rabbis and scholars regard the Muslims to be worshiping the God of Abraham. They openly say it. Okay. We may have our we may have our disagreements on many things, but on Tawheed, the oneness of Allah, the oneness of God the God of Abraham, the God of Moses, uh, peace be upon them, is the God that we worship. And this is what the Jewish hold as well, generally speaking. I mean, I'm going to... I'm gonna no, See, the thing, the thing, Joseph, for me... Hurt, and I don't want to be hurtful. Um, no, no, that's fine. You're being very friendly. But my point is, Christ told the Jewish leaders who they were truly following. And they were not following the Father. 
And so that's not a plus. Um, that's a minus. No, no, but, Joseph, the point is not just what the Jews say. The point is that from Adam, all of the prophets came down with the same message, which was worship nothing in the heavens and the earth except for God. There was no concept of Trinity, a triune God. It no, was it I'm was forbidden. Agree. It was forbidden to make images or statues or of paintings idols, yeah, of, or pictures that you have behind you. All of now, these things that you got behind you were forbidden. May they I were ask, forbidden. No, no, but let me just make let me finish my point. Let me let me just finish my point. Finish your point. So from Adam, we see the same thing, the same message. Worship nothing. Don't make idols. Don't make these images. Don't make these pictures. You can't worship saints. You can't venerate bones. You can't do any of these things because all of this is idolatry. All of this was considered to be idolatry. Can I ask and, you? And, 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 and paganism and many of the pagan practices, we can clearly see, Joseph. Can I ask you a question? Because you're making a lot of claims a lot of Protestants make too. But in the in the Acts of the Apostles, what did people do with the handkerchiefs of the Apostle Paul? Which, which people, handkerchiefs which, they, which people are you referring to? The pagan people? No, Christians. What were they doing? They took the handkerchiefs of the Apostle after he left the city, and they were placing them on people to heal them of diseases. Now, I bring up and, this and point. That, and, which point? That, well, that's that's actually where re veneration of relics comes from, but uh, and saints' relics. But the whole point is no, not, that image behind you. I realize I don't. Joseph. I did. I first off, I've always had that. I've had that image Wait, for Joseph, ages. So I didn't mean to offend anyone with. No, you're it. not offending anybody. It's, yeah, Joseph, but the, the whole point second, is, Joseph. So you're talking about relics. Mm -hmm. So you, you you do this subtle. It's a, it's a maybe unintentional, but you've changed the the goalpost. How? Well, was not talking about relics. He was talking about idols, statues, images. Well, he mentioned the saints. He said worship he of said idols, statues, and images. He's talking he about the pictures saints. behind you. You, you gave an example of a relic. Did now that's their, their head. Imran, the that's not fair. If Abbas said saints, and I'm addressing saints, I, I did say, I did uh, say, yeah, I did say. Yeah, so. I, but, 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 but the thing here, Joseph, is that it's a, it's all of these things, not just the one that you find convenient to respond to. <laughs> well, yeah, but no, but it, but that's a very important one because you're talking about pagan practices. We see this with the veneration of the bones of Elisha in the Old Testament. Now, let's consider this. Let's consider this for a moment because I know this has a relevance in Islam as well. Because when Muhammad died, he was, uh, you know, they, he was like, "Don't make a big, don't make a big deal about my body," if I remember correctly. And then what did they do? They built a giant tomb that I think he was he was kind no, of against no, they, that. No, they didn't. No, Joseph. Isn't no, the tomb of Muhammad like giant? I've seen no, it. It's pretty no, big. No, no. It's not actually. It's um, it's actually. Okay, I haven't seen it in person, so. Yeah. Um, because well, Joseph, the, the mosque was testified that there's only one no God worthy yeah, worship. And, and Joseph, the what a lot of perhaps people fail to appreciate is that the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, died in the house of uh, Aisha radiallahu anha, which mm -hmm. only had a curtain between it and the masjid, the mosque. And oh, so, okay, so, so, so basically so, most of it was the mosque, and then so, the, rest, the, the so, the so, so the, the prophets are buried where they die. So the prophet was buried there. And the mosque was already the there. The masjid <laughs> yeah. was already there. And so the masjid got bigger and bigger and bigger. So oh. it's not so it's not a tomb, i.e. Right. to go and venerate or, or worship, God forbid. Right. That's my know, low Wikipedia. Wikipedia. It's Wikipedia and, and, level and, knowledge. I didn't know fact, that. I Joseph, apologize. And and that's okay. And in fact, Joseph, the first khalif, Abu Bakr anhu, he said to the people, All those who worship Muhammad know that Muhammad is dead. Sallallahu yeah. alayhi wa well, we and don't believe all, that. We and all those who worshipped and all those who worship the Lord of Muhammad know that he is ever living. Mm -hmm. So there was an immediate distinction made between the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon mm -hmm. him, as the Quran makes the the, the difference and the and the spe specificity of or specifying the nature of Jesus. Allah says it's the similitude to Adam, just as we created Adam from neither mother or father. In other words, Jesus was created out of a miracle of Allah, which was the virgin birth. But Allah is trying to make you think that the similitude, the comparison is that to Adam, because Adam was created without mother or father. That's so literally Allah in our teachings that Christ is the new Adam. But the point is that... But Adam wasn't God, right? No, but Adam was, but Adam was the firstborn of creation, was he not? 
Yeah, but so he's not the, God. That's the point. So the point is that Christ brings about a new creation to reverse. That's why the concept, we believe it or not, the concept of reversion is something that exists in Christianity. So, so do you the, believe that God sent Jesus then? I believe that Jesus is God and that he, he came down. So yeah. you could say the did, Father did he sent come him. down of his own accord or did the Father send him? Uh, they were in agreement. But yeah, the, he says the Father sent me. So the Father I, sent him. Yeah, so but, is, we, is, but is did he, one, was he in a disagreement with the Father? Is, no. Is the one equal who sends to the one who is being sent? Uh, not always. How can they be equal? They because the question of sending does not address whether they're equal or not. It's well, simply the one who is what? sending. The one who is sending is in authority, isn't he? No. Well, it can be seen that way, but it doesn't have to. Um, you know, the Trinity of relations does not require. I mean, the Father alone is cause, but that does not mean that He tells the others what to do. He's simply sending forth because he's the first principle. Yeah, so so God is the first principle. No, the Father is the first principle. That's yeah. what we say. God, yeah, okay. The Father is the first principle, right? Yeah. Father alone is class. And, and Jesus is the begotten, he is begotten of the Father. Of the Father. Eternally. Is the one, he's, he's is the the one that is is the one that is begotten greater than the one that begets? No, I wouldn't say that. Is the one that begets greater than the one that's begotten? I, I don't think so, no. So can the can the son exist without the father? Um when you say can the, no, they can't. Can the, they, can the, the Holy father, Spirit cannot exist with either. Can the father either, yeah. exist? Can the father exist without the son? No. The father cannot exist without the son. Correct. Okay. Well, think about it. Well, if you look at John 1 1, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. How can God speak with no word? That, is that John one one? That's John one one. Uh, there's oh, a yes. there's a problem there. Like, you, do you, do you realize uh, that John one one? If you read it literally, in the Greek, I think it differs from how Christians presently understand it. I would uh, say this is one of the most argued over passages in history. So most likely, you're, yeah, you most might likely not be right, right on that. But there, there's a, a thing I note here, which is that the Christ of Christianity. I, I could be wrong. In the four Gospels, I don't recall him referring to himself as the Word of God. I think that this is something from the Johannine Prologue that's yeah. attributed to Christ, but mm -hmm. there is a lack of awareness of this by Christ himself within the Gospels. I disagree. What, um, where does Christ? Yeah, please happily teach me. Well, I, I, I'm, yeah, I'm not trying to be rude or anything, but I'm saying yeah. that. He does not say he does not state directly, for example, that I am the word of God, but he definitely does ascribe divinity to himself, as I've brought up before, uh, when he talks about, you know, being older than Abraham, uh, who's obviously been dead for 2000 years and decla declaring himself. I am. There's a purpose to that. And the purpose is to say that, in fact, he is of divine origin. So, so if, what, can, can, I, Jazz, can I just quickly ask, Joseph, is, so is one of the criteria is that he doesn't have a beginning, is that right? Correct. Do you believe in Melchizedek? I don't know if you're, um, uh, do you believe in Melchizedek? The high priest in the Old Testament? Yeah. Yes, he does. Yeah. So he, it said that he has no beginning and has no end. So is he also divine then? Uh, Melchizedek physically himself, the saint? No. Uh, he is a human, however... Uh, his reference is a type of Christ, is what we would call him. We would, these are the things, like when we talk about the Oak of Mamre, these are types that the early church would see, that the Old Testament church would see, but not fully understand. And so they become clearer. That is why the priestly role of the job of the priest when he uh, does the Eucharist, etc., makes countless references to Melchizedek because of the fact that he is serving in the role that Christ provided to reinstitute the temple. So do you believe that Melchizedek didn't have a beginning? No, I believe he was a human. No, no. Do you believe that he did not have a beginning? He never began to exist? No, Melchizedek did begin to exist. He was a baby once and then he died. But that's not what the Bible says, though, is it? Well, we can go to the Bible if you'd like. Hey, Which uh, verse are we talking about? Imran Jazz, can you bring up the verse? I'm not... Uh... Sure. 
have some patience with me, though. I'm kind of you. You can see I'm a bit of a dum dum. So no, not at all. You've been uh, quite interesting and and uh, enjoyable to have on. So you want to prove to us that uh, Melchizedek's description is incorrectly given? Well, let me just, I want to see the description we're referring to so we're not in disagreement on it, because that's, I think, more important. Uh, which book is this? Yeah, so you're, you're representing the faith there. Uh, it's kind of been like, a, it's been a while, so I, I feel like I have to now. I'm invested. <laughs> I think it's um is it seven three Hebrews seven three. He's without father, father without mother, without genealogy, he has neither beginning of days nor end of life. Moment. Hebrews three. I'll put seven it three, yeah, I see it. Yeah, I'm reading I'll put right it right on the screen. There you go. It's on the screen. It says he's without father or mother. So you said he was a baby. So I'm, how can he be a baby if he didn't have a father or a mother? Or, ge or genealogy. In other words, there's no, there are no descendants. There are no people, um, uh, no parents, no grandparents, no, no family before. He has neither beginning of days nor end of life. I'm just looking here because uh, honestly in this St. Paul is kind of indicating that Melchizedek is a type of Christ, but I don't think he is actually claiming that he had no beginning and no end. Um, give me one moment. But that's what the words say. We don't, we shouldn't agree with the words. Well, no, I'm saying he's bringing it up to make, to show Melchizedek as a type of Christ. Um, that's why we refer to the high priest in the order of Melchizedek. Um, but let me just see here. Give me just a moment. Yeah, the point is that what we don't see... Um, the point is that Christ is a priest in the line of the order of Melchizedek. But when we look in the Old Testament, there's really no indication that he's without beginning or without end. I mean, we can look. In so Genesis, you, are we going to ignore the words in Hebrews about that? We're not ignoring them. What I'm saying is he's applying them differently than you're interpreting them. Um, if in other what, words, what is, How is he implying them? Because if you read on, it says it actually confirms that he lives on. Well, let's uh, let's read, let's put it up yeah. on the screen. Yeah. Um, okay, so let's take let's see here. So, without father, without mother, without genealogy, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but made unto the Son of God, like unto the Son of God, abideth a priest continually. Now consider how great this man was. Um, I, this is an important point here. Upon whom Abraham the patriarch gave a, a tenth of the chief spoils. So, how could? If continue, it was continue, without no, no, no. But we, have, gonna, we have you're going to miss the point that I've asked you to get okay. to. Sure, okay. And they indeed of the sons of Levi that received the priest's office have commandment to take tithes of the people according to the law, that is of their brothers, though these have come out of the loins of Abraham. But he whose genealogy is not counted from them hath taken tithes of Abraham and has blessed him that hath the promises. But without any dispute, the less is blessed of the better. Okay. And here men die that receive that die receive tithes, but they're one of whom does witness that he liveth. And so to say, well, though, oh, hang on one second. Mm -hmm. So what? Read that again. That verse. And here men that die receive tithes, but there is one of whom it is witness that he liveth. Yes. yes. This is talking about Christ. No, it says. It... I, this well, let me see what I'm reading here. This is uh, that's my point. Melchizedek one second, receives one the second, tithe. I'll, I'll explain to you. This mm -hmm. is from Bible Hub. I'll put, let me put it on the screen for you so you can sure. you can see because I don't I don't want you uh, think suggesting that I'm misreading this. No, so, I, 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 I I'm not saying you're misreading. No, no, you are I'm, reading I'm, it, but I'm no, saying you. It's just uh, so you can see this. Right? Mm -hmm. It says in the case of the Levites, mortal men collect the tenth. But in the case of Melchizedek, it is affirmed that he lives on. Mm -hmm. 
So this is affirming that this the words that we have above, without father, without mother, neither beginning of days or end of life. Mm -hmm. He remains a priest for all time, like the Son of God. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So your so your uh, your statement about him being him dying it, it, it's, it's refuted twice within this. Well, I just agree that it's, I, I don't I don't think it's, men. Right, but I don't think it's, but in the case of Melchizedek, he lives on. It is affirmed he lives on. I feel like you're you're kind of ignoring the symbolism here. Um, yeah, he's referring. What I'm saying to you, that right, but what, what, what happens is that if something. So this is where we were going. We're going back to the beginning of the circle, and maybe it's a good place to end it. Whenever it comes down to uh, confirming the message and understanding what is actually being said, um, we can either refer to the words or we can refer to things that you say are tradition, symbolism now, that seem to go against the words. And this is the problem that we have, that, we're, that really what we're relying on is either subjective feelings or interpretations that don't seem to fit the objective data that we have accessible to us. Well, I mean, if I can make a clear response to that, um, I would say that in the first place, in the reading itself, he refers to Melchizedek in past tense. However, this is while the temple presumably is either recently destroyed or exists. Melchizedek to St. Paul in that reading is dead. It the is a term is, that he lives on. Is not in the past tense. The point is he's making allusions to Christ. No, so you're, as you're, the, you're, the point that you made about past tense is incorrect. It says it is a firm that he lives on. Now that's all future tense and present tense. Well, no. It, well, here, let me get, get to where it was. Um, here, Let me see here. And they indeed... Let me see here. But he's going to... Because let me see here. Joseph, if you want, you can mull over this question. Get some well, it's not, there's nothing to mull over. Melchizedek's dead. Nobody believes that he's alive. St. Paul didn't believe he was alive. He um, that he lives on. But he lives on through Christ. He was a type. Nobody, there was no Jew at the time who believed that Melchizedek was physically alive in the temple. It's just not true. So the point is he died. They don't know how he died. He was a mystery, and if in the Old Testament, they don't mention that he lived immortally or anything like that. That's the whole point is he's using Melchizedek as a type to explain but I understand the priesthood what you're saying, of Christ. Because this is something that you're asserting, um, but it's going against the direct words that are there. It talks about his lack of genealogy, his lack of a beginning or end of days, his, his being a priest for all time, and the fact that mortal men collect the tenth, and it is affirmed that he lives on. So I think uh, probably this is a reasonable place. To I think it's, I think it's fair. We're not going to agree on this. You're going to yeah. you're arguing that Saint Paul says Melchizedek is physically alive at the time. No, I'm not arguing. Think. I'm saying the text of this uh, that you present. There's the text that you. And I, I'm uh, saying that it's expressing symbolism for you. The you Messiah. make it metaphorical. Yeah. That's no problem. So not what, metaphorical. Symbol, it's a sign. It's a type. Yeah, you make it a symbolism, which yeah, is it's a, type, it's a type. type. The yeah, words are not literal. They're to be interpreted in another way. Well, I would say that it's a, rep a representation to a people who didn't fully understand what became physically manifest with Christ. So, so, Joseph, the question would arise that if a person were to not know about Christianity and they would read this verse, mm -hmm. would it be reasonable for them to assume that this Melchizedek that it talks about doesn't have a father, doesn't have a mother, doesn't have genealogy, he has never began to exist, and nor does he have end of life. Would they come to these conclusions? They could. Um, that is not the way. I mean, the fact that, Bi unfortunately, the fact that Bibles are widely printed now doesn't mean that that's the way they were meant to be used. I think the word not is not could. The word is would. Well, I wouldn't. We, but that's not the belief of the church. And the church is 2,000 years old, so if that's not our belief, why would I say, well, but, sure, that's no, but, what it means. No, but, no, Joseph, that wasn't the question. I asked you what the church believes. The question was... The could, question, a, could a person come to that conclusion? So, so, when a per, so look, the reason why I'm asking you this question is not actually to corner you. This is not some checkmate or, 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 or mic dropping move right. or whatever. Yeah. The reason why I'm asking you this question is that we... In, Initially, remember, one of the contentions that I had mm -hmm. was that the words are very important because the words are what should guide the church and the church fathers and the doctrine. It should not be the other way round. 
That's exactly the Protestant argument. But because, and I'll tell you why. Because because these are supposed to be the words of God, so they should be your guide. How can man's words overtake the words of God? I would argue that man's words aren't overtaking the words of God, but that man's tra that the tradition of the church guides the meaning of the text. Tradition of the church, which is the tradition of men within the church, who are going to decide how men they're going to interpret the word. Inspired by the Holy Spirit. As but it they, says in the scriptures itself. Yeah, but then if they're inspired by the word of God, they should all believe exactly the same thing, shouldn't and they? And they do. But we've, but we've already explained, and you've already explained, that there were errors, and there are errors that have crept in. There are differences of opinion. They can't all be guided by the Holy Ghost, then can Absolutely they? Absolutely not. That's my point. I think uh, my, uh, point uh, is, uh, my point uh, is that uh, that just uh, establishes uh, that there is uh, an orthodoxy uh, against heresy. Oh, sorry, anyway, Joseph, it was, a, it, it was that, a pleasure uh, to have you on. And, likewise. Um, Imran, if you want to sorry, say something, sorry, please. Oh, do. That's fine. I'll, I'll, I wish you all the best, Joseph. Wish it's you all no the best. No problem. Take and, care. Uh, you're welcome to come back again, and I'm sure yeah, we'll... Yeah, maybe uh, sometime. I'm, I'm on bu getting busier, but, you know, God bless you all. Enjoy. Have a great day, okay? Yeah, have a lovely evening yourself, Joseph. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye -bye. Okay. Um, Jaz, sorry, did you want to add anything before we get the next guest on, 